on the concept of reciprocity. Um, and, and then another concept, which is more political, which is the social contract. Um, but by combining let's say, those conceptual um, tools, I tried to develop some kind of a new analytical framework to, 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 to just compare, not to say what will or should happen, but just to compare systems, um, which I think is very useful, especially as we enter into this new, let's say, space, which combine a physical and digital component. And uh, for me, I felt that was very helpful to understand where we came from, and that might help us define where we want to go. And that enabled me to kind of identify first some challenges, and then propose some maybe, let's say, alternatives or ways to go forward. And, um, and I think COVID is, is one of those time in, in history where, where people step back and might be ready actually to uh, consider new approaches. But those new approaches shouldn't necessarily replace the older one. Maybe they could complement it. And uh, by complementing it, then you can shift maybe actually the dynamic and um, the way things evolve. And I think that's really important to keep things in dialogue. Yeah. Uh, people tend to be either afraid, angry, so suddenly it's things fun. become black and white, past and future. But I think at one point you have to find a way to kind of uh, be more organic about it. And that's what Integrate to, uh, into real world. Yeah, but look, it's the very simple way I've, I've described it is kind of this, let's say, physically bound world and this kind of uh, digitally open world, which, let's say, are two different games. And, uh, but you should combine those. And, uh, and the thing actually, look, the, the, the digital industry um, is mature enough now to realize that, look, they cannot go alone. They need to, to bring people with them in order to find a solution together. Otherwise, actually, it's not sustainable. Uh, so um, this is why I think it's a very peculiar time. And um, so I also wrote a few white papers to kind of prepare the ground. But, uh, can, you, can you send me some? Yeah, yeah they're available on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the web. I've decided to make them available because uh, um, I said, look, what's the point of... Uh, for, yeah. for, two, for two years, I used them to um, mostly with academic, politician, multilateral organization, central banks, to kind of prepare the ground, to say, look, there's no need to kill the baby in, or let's say, the, in the egg. Um, it will be there, it will emerge, better prepare for it, and maybe find ways to, to, to dialogue. And I think now it's maybe the time to, um, to make it happen. But again, I think it should be something which is open, transparent, and more like a gift, because yeah. if, you don't, don't, if you don't do it like this, um, and I thought really hard about it, I, I said, look, there's no point. If you start actually uh, launching it like a startup, whatever, et cetera, you go, you go back into the old system. Um, yeah, the VC you, route of 100x return. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> which at the end would reduce the potential of it. Look, if you had done that with internet, uh, it would be today a great, what, maybe corporate, uh, let's say, uh, uh, yep. platform for people to exchange emails uh, because yep. actually CERN and whoever was behind it, Tim Burns-Lee and others just let the code out it became what it is today uh, with of course yeah. additional layers where people kind of uh, let's say uh, started to own part of it wh which you need to otherwise you cannot invest in building the infrastructure mm -hmm. but, but, but I felt in my case that um, and that's why I created a little kind of think tank incubation uh, to say, look, uh, this could be great ingredients to start thinking differently about the recipe. And, and, and maybe from there on, new things might emerge. Eventually, some opportunities, more commercial one, might, might, might come along. But you, you need to create a new space. So to do that, um, yeah, it's like, it's like an enzyme. You almost lead, need to let it out for then actually mm -hmm. the metabolism to transform itself uh, from within. And um, so that's why I've started with the books. Well, initially I started actually with what I did on my advisory, strategic and investment side, because I felt, look, I need to go deep into the system. But then I wrote my books because I felt uh, it was the right time. And, and then some of those um, uh, white papers. And then actually I, I joined one or two hackathons uh, to, to develop some concrete solutions to concrete problems, but with that new mindset. And uh, what's really interesting is um, our generation or my generation, 
some understand. The younger generation understands, but the really younger generation, on one of my hackathons, I had, I think, a 16, 17 year old schoolboy. And uh, look, he was uh, totally aligned and got it right away. And, yeah, there's uh, a term for this woke. <laughs> yeah, is it woke? That's how you call it? Woke. Like, woke. Uh, yeah, like, he, I don't know. Awakened. Awaken. Yeah, awaken. No, but see, I've always seen our responsibility to put out the tools for this new generation to channel the energy and their willingness for purpose. And, um, and uh, look, maybe, maybe COVID could be um, a catalyst. way to... Can yeah, catalyst. That's where I do it. So yeah. that's why, look, um, I heard about you, then I had Audrey, I think, was last week over the phone, and she said, oh, I should check those and those and those. I said, oh, yeah, why not? And, um, and that's why I connected, not really knowing what uh, it was all about. Um, but um, it sounded really interesting. I has been on Kaggle for, for a little while just to get to use and see actually how they, they put forward actually all their various systems and everything. Um, look, I think time, time is interesting. And like all recipe, we, we need to combine ingredients to make it actually yep. uh, tasty and uh, interesting. Yeah. I'm and using that uh, analogy way too often in internal communications because we're actually... Like, uh, here's the, the vision that I'm thinking of. And here's, like, sometimes it's very hard for us to all synchronize because we all come from such different backgrounds, mm -hmm. professions, even cultures. Mm -hmm. Like, whenever we have people, like, from Ukraine, from Eastern Europe, talk mm -hmm. with Americans, there's a clash of cultures when mm -hmm. people are more straightforward and people are more polite. And those things, they don't interact in the, in the right way. But even in terms of professional experience, we use different words to describe the same thing. We frequently don't understand each other. And sometimes you're kind of sitting in the background, listening to two people argue, and you're like, oh, well, you're talking about the same thing. You're just describing mm -hmm. it differently. Yeah, and that's why it's, it's very hard to kind of create that shared vision and but the thing that unites us is the actual values uh that we all share and somehow again we we keep attracting people with shared beliefs and values uh, at first i was like that's just you know natural you know this is a natural behavior organic behavior for any human individual since then i a little bit changed my my mind because there are still people that join us for different purposes uh, that might be different and there are some people that are observing us as you know something uh, interesting and as a phenomenon uh, to be used in the, in the current uh, infrastructure of things mm -hmm. but yeah like I've spent the last uh, six years basically following the existing system of, uh, you know, VC, venture world. And um, my main impact was a byproduct of all of this acti activity, which is something that I've always struggled. Like, I always want to create impact first versus the, the actual financial output. But unfortunately, the current system optimizes otherwise. Mm -hmm. And you almost have to follow the 100x to actually get to any kind of uh, meaningful impact. And that, that's why like, there are a lot of things that we're ideating in terms of how do we actually create a new uh, open, transparent thing that keeps growing and keeps creating this potential for like students that want to do internships or for programmers that want to do open source or for researchers that want to finally have infrastructure that is more open than all of these journals and all crazy inefficiencies that um, are, are not sufficient and are dysfunctional to the current needs as we've seen in, in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like it's, it's definitely something interesting. We're at the, at the beginning of this, like crossing this chasm, you know, both technological, because a lot mm. of it is technology and creating infrastructure mm. to fa facilitate mm. all of this, um, but also mentally in terms of how do we not lose all of these, you know, thousand people? How do we make sure that whenever mm. pandemic is gone, they don't revert to the same mm. state that they were before? Mm. And mm. I've, I basically, like, I've cut down my commercial activity to almost nothing. 
And for the past two months, I've only left like a couple of companies that I'm helping within the typical commercial uh, activity, even though those I also treat as the ones with the potential for major impact. And that's why I believe they will survive the current uh, economic crisis. And yeah, there are so many crazy ideas, so many um, visions. We definitely uh, are creating the, like if you narrow down the vision to very like microscopic level, we're going to create the first AI powered literature review tool, which is going to simplify and actually help researchers manage this coronavirus uh, overload because there's so much stuff. Just last mm. week, there were like a thousand new papers published mm. and like mm. it's impossible to read them all. So mm. that's the first mini kind of value uh, product, which is gonna, going to be open source and anyone can use it. The, the next step is kind of going level beyond and creating a thing that we call discovery engine. Mm. And this is something, uh, the great analogy dichotomy that I showcase is Google is a search engine and for you to find something, you have to know what to look for. And you mm. go in there and mm. you type in, you know, um, something like, uh, I don't know, car. coronavirus, yeah. Uh, yeah, car, and you find <laughs> it because you know it exists, right? Mm. Obviously. Mm. But if you don't know about something that exists, but you need to find it, like there is no way to find it. And the only way is just like jumping from hyperlinks to hyperlinks in, mm. in the search of uh, meaning and causal connections. And, or you get directed by someone, by typically a human so, individual. So you, you, you need a nonlinear engine. Yep. And I, I, again, I'm not a physicist, but a lot of it resonates with the physical, uh, you know, phenomenon of observers um, creating knowledge out of the environment. And obviously that knowledge is different for any different observer. So there is no objective knowledge. There is just data that reduces uncertainty about the environment in which observer operates. So this discovery uh, engine is something truly beautiful that I believe like if it's going to be created, that's going to be a new way of navigating knowledge um, and definitely a, that high ambition. But mm -hmm. even, um, sorry. That's fine. Sorry, got parking. Okay. Um, what I was saying is that this uh, highly ambitious goal is basically something that I compare to creating a browser for mm. the internet. And I, I'm really fascinated by the vision of Mozilla Foundation being open source and sustainable organization mm. that brought us, uh, you know, mm. a browser by definition. And um, yeah, like there's a lot of stuff to change in this world. And I, I truly believe that the only change will be systemic, but we have to integrate into it and we have to adapt slowly. And that's why even though I, I started Corona Y as this radically transparent organization, you know, you can go to our YouTube and see every single meeting that we had recorded, which is just, mm -hmm. you know, amazing. Um, but I also started realizing whenever we started uh, getting people that uh, asked for not to be recorded because, you know, it's sensitive information or they work for organization or a government or, you know, different kinds of situations when they cannot publicly express, um, you know, either their opinion mm. or the actual like sensitive information. And that's why I started realizing that like as much as uh, we want to create radical transparency, it has to be internal. And externally, we have to adapt to realities of the world and be, be flexible enough to be sustainable. I think governance is key and uh, it has to be adaptable. And uh, look, you cannot impose radical transparency to, to everyone in every situation. So uh, I think you're right. Is it there? 
Of course, my phone died. Luckily enough, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. no worries. Yeah, luckily, yeah. I always bring my computer with me. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. That is quick. Yep. That is quick and efficient. Yep. So, um, no, but I have to say, uh, we are a very important time. And um, look, if you can contribute one way or another to, um, let's say, help at this stage or at one of your next stage, um, I'll be more more than happy. I would I would I would bring, as I mentioned to you, more this um, maybe new 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 conceptual approach, um, which could be complementary. And um, look, there could be some commonalities. And uh, um, I think maybe what is missing today is some kind of an incentive engine to kind of uh, let's say let this current ecosystem survive and maybe thrive. Um, it's sustainable, you know. Yeah, it's sustainable, and but but it, it shouldn't it shouldn't challenge actually the the existing culture and, and aspiration. But um, um, I think that could be that could be something interesting for you also to to consider actually as so you get to that next stage. How do you actually like? Here's here's a problem, right? The definition of the problem. You've got thousand members that are already filtered by their extreme desire to help. And because, I mean, we've got like probably 10,000 people visiting the website across the last three months, but only 1,000 actually joined. And that's a natural filter for their commitment, willingness to fill out the form, actually join Slack and, you know, do some stuff. But even for them, like, obviously there is real work. There is, there are many other things they have to worry in this current crazy environment. Some people have kids, some people have, you know, um, extremely demanding work uh, environments and work-life balance is also a thing. So how do you imagine, given like conceptually, actually surviving and becoming sustainable within the environment that will most probably change in the unknown directions in the 
next three months? Turn right on the down ramp. Well, um, I, th I think what, what you have to do is try to understand actually um, what kind of trade off we can create for them. Um, and today the trade-off is very simple, is uh, I give you some hours of my time uh, to contribute to um, a solution that is actually systemic, uh, challenging, which is COVID. Um, so the trade-off is kind of basic security for time. Um, but I think um, what could be embedded into that approach could be something um, where suddenly um, that time could be used maybe for other things than simply addressing actually that security. Meaning by addressing that security challenge, they could also benefit, let's say, let's say to leverage that time for another benefit to themselves. And we'll learn that it's actually true. Most people like come, they're not super experts. So they want to learn in this dynamic environment uh, to how to become better professionals, how to become mm. better AI and machine learning engineers, mm. because the speed of things here is like ultra speed. We call it mm. coronavirus uh, time, and, and it's calculated, you know, 10 times faster than the mm. regular timeline. Of course, of course. Yeah, and the other thing is credibility, because in, uh, you know, in 2020, there will be this kind of a question like or, or after it it will be what have you done in 2020 and it mm -hmm. will be either i got laid off and i did nothing or i volunteered and mm -hmm. i did something for for the cause and that's a strong motivator from what i'm seeing and that's mm -hmm. why all the like students that lost their internship opportunities are mm -hmm. also coming to us because you know we give them enough credibility obviously we can't compete with other big companies mm -hmm. that's why we're losing some of the students to um you know big corporations with uh, more exciting infrastructure and, and resources but even that like the fact that we're compete competing with companies like lockheed martin mm -hmm. like that's like powerful you know it's really powerful yeah. the fact that um the other use case uh, actually which i cannot explain at all there is a group of researchers, extremely intelligent researchers from Harvard Madison department. They built this tool called Indra, which is um, basically a causal reasoning engine for knowledge mm -hmm. graphs. And they joined our Slack and they're working in our Slack. And they gave this tool for us to uh, build into our infrastructure. And you're like, wait, what? Like, why? are people from Harvard joining mm -hmm. us and hanging out in our Slack channel. Yeah, but the one, the, one, the one actually that opened is flexibility and agility. But I think actually what is key in what you're doing is also to keep some kind of traceability of contributions. Um, so that actually, if you have one branch of the tree emerging, like the one from Harvard, um, you know actually how it came in and how it developed. So that it's not, um, no. if it's not just not lost to anyone, I think it would be, that would be the first, value would be to say, look, if there are some key branches emerging from the system, then you should be able to trace it so that actually people could at least say, look, I contributed at that time. Then what happens with it is another story. But I think that's maybe also important, that kind of openness and transparency uh, uh, ethos is to keep track of, of, of some of the contributions, because then actually people could use it as a way to strengthen uh, either the competencies, but also to say, look, <gasps> I did something during that time. Yeah. And you create an environment for those people actually to trace that actually impact. So one way or another, I think culturally, it's very important to say, look, if there were some key contributions to, to, to have some traceability to it, it doesn't mean there is some financial return. That's not what we're talking about. It's more about actually, uh, yeah, having a trace of the contribution and the impact. So uh, We're that's talking maybe about this concept of journal or contribution tracker, which yeah. basically follows all the interactions on Slack, on Trello, and GitHub, and maps mm -hmm. it into like a timeline of things progressing, and like it's technologically like challenging to do that, but in a way we also um, got some tools that already extract mm -hmm. data from Slack. And uh, it's, it's fascinating because you can immediately see that we don't have hierarchy. 
we have clusters of people mm -hmm. that cross communicate in different environments and then you see the results of these people collaborating it's not some ephemeral you know corona y it's just like this cluster was working on vaccines and therapeutics and these are the people that were helping them mm -hmm. and even the you know people that jumped into a channel just to like contribute for a little bit, they still helped. They helped, mm -hmm. you know, discover something meaningful or connection to other tasks or reuse of common code and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. All of these things, however little they are, you know, decimal, fractional, mm -hmm. can make they a still difference. contribute. Yeah. yeah. And uh, no, I think that's key. And that's also a way for you to learn actually how the organism works and to maybe fine tune and, 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 and structure it in a way which can be actually even more impactful over time. Yeah. It's really an iterative process. So it's not wasted. And I think it's a way to build bonds and trust. And at the end, that's actually what we need to keep is that trust um, along, along the path. And um, when the beginning of the trust is there, it's simply because you have a common challenge over time you need to sustain it. And um, that's where you start to think about actually mechanism, tools, ways of doing it. Let me show you something very cool. So we found this open source tool and mm. uh, it connects to Slack and extracts everything. And it has a like, people land, users clustered by their channel members. You can see all of these people and how they interact with each other and with what clusters. And mm. it's just fascinating. That's and cool. There are other things like channel heartbeat, um, like how different mm. channels are uh, actually like messaging. There is mm. also channel end, so main channels and how things are happening. So yeah, it's possible. It's just very challenging in terms mm. of um, like figuring out how to put mm. all of these pieces together and like actually deliver something because w you get the analysis paralysis you you get so much data and so many things that you're kind of overloaded with what to focus on and even though i come from the startup environment and the mvp you know is the like the mantra right mm -hmm. like you gotta deliver at least something and push it to the market in this environment even i'm overloaded because mm -hmm. it's so many amazing things and so many things that i cannot even conceptualize but when i do and my brain works in diagrams. Whenever I create one, that becomes very, very hard to actually showcase to mm -hmm. um, to people at scale. You know, one to one, I'm able to do that, and I'm able to explain myself. But when you're speaking to a thousand people, all these layers of multidisciplinary, multi-professionalism, and everything, it adds up to the extent of no one understanding nothing mm. and and it's crazy so this is the the most like challenging diagram to, to explain and this mm. is uh basically everything that we're doing from a technology standpoint mm. and it's also like explanation of all these like ontologies that exist mm. for different tasks and mm. the discovery engine mm. which is that produce analogy, abduction and deduction analogy, mm. cooking reduction analogy, ingredients, mm. recipes. Mm. <laughs> so we have the same language. <laughs> yep, yep. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and we have kind of like an interface to that, right? Mm. And it functions like a search engine. It helps you mm. find some stuff, but it also works as an inference engine. It actually mm. reduces uncertainty. In, in the environment and of course mm. there should be a tracing engine to mm. make sure there's explainability and traceability of the system mm. because mm. imagine some researcher coming to us finding something that is going to help COVID-19 and then coming back to White House and saying hey there is this drug we should try it and they're like so how how did you learn about this mm. he's gonna oh so some amazing AI tool on the internet told me that mm. and like that that's not acceptable and that's the problem that is not solved in ai world uh, that's a, a big problem of explainability of ai like uh, darpa um us mm. agency of uh, defense also is is working on this initiative and funding it left and right but it's just so hard that i don't even think we'll be able to solve it we'll have to partner with companies like 
uh, you know, deep like Google, deep mm. decisions, and others to even attempt to solve. That. Mm. No, but I think at one point anyway, there there will need to be some some partnerships to to, to create that ecosystem, and uh, you just have to hope that actually the partners have kept some kind of long term thinking and um, openness and flexibility and uh, that they can say okay fine that space needs to be left free it can create amazing opportunities down the road but it has to be kept free while we have our other part of the business which is more traditional anchored in reality and generating cash but um, if they can have this kind of ambidextrous uh, approach um, then i think this is the best way for the entire system actually to uh, to iterate in a positive way and rapidly um, but we need those anchors because uh, it's not you, me, or a few guys. Even with technology, we can really make the difference. What I have realized is actually through new concepts and ideas, these can be very powerful. Um, but you have to be very humble. You have to let them out there and uh, for the system to digest. And Wrong answer. And the biggest thing that I've learned through the past three months is that I'm 100% wrong all the time. And the sooner I learn it, the, the more utility I can create for this world. No, exactly. And uh, so there a lot of humility, I think, is, is important. And, and you, you go step by step. And, um, and then sometimes you need to bridge worlds that have not much in common because they have complementary views. But actually, as you rightly said early on, have different ways of actually describing the same thing. Um, it's just a question of uh, finding that common language. And then maybe maybe now is the time actually to... Yeah. You know, I, I've never uh, understood that uh, story and that uh, dilemma of Babylon to Babel Tower. Uh, mm. And, you know, I, months ago, I talked about this with a, a guy that, um, you know, was able to explain it to me. And then it like immediately resonated. Like, what is that story about? It, it is about the common speech and how it how it's very hard to achieve mm. that state of common speech and build something mm. collective mm. at mm. scale no and that, that's why i think you need to go back to the most basic of all concepts and uh let's say mind frames uh, which then can be actually translated in every single situation language yeah. and, and whatever and that's why i think my, my my angle of using anthropology by chance um, has been very powerful because at the end uh, they are the people who have tried to conceptualize let's say uh, frameworks who which explains everything from social behavior to economic uh, behavior to political structures uh, all based on the most basic of our needs which is who are we as individual and who are we as individual within a community uh, and that's look uh, what defines us as being human so having that type of a, let's say narrative um, can can be very powerful in understanding actually how we are we're going through those transforming um, periods so for me it has been very useful to kind of engage and connect and uh, and then conceptualize and um, and then look code is only a way then to formalize it yeah um, that's what it is at the end. Um, we needed code today to build infrastructure, but now we are at a time where maybe we can just actually formalize some of those conceptual and uh, more philosophical concepts, which I think is, is, is important. And COVID is maybe actually the platform to, uh, to propose. Yep. Not to impose, but to propose. And, and it's a bit like uh, financier defining it as a call option, meaning it's, it's an open option and uh, whether it will actually... Uh, resonate or not that's something to, yeah. to to define so that's why a bit like you what i've decided to do is kind of uh, propose and uh, then maybe the right people get together and uh, look uh, something can 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 come out of it 100 percent um so let let's do this because uh, i don't want to overwhelm you for right now because if you join slack because audrey has been in slack since the very beginning and okay. you got overwhelmed like there's so much stuff happening as you can imagine mm -hmm. That like she she was overloaded. That's why I I started having individual calls with her, and that's how we progressed. And actually, I met her partner, and we seem to resonate. And we're ideating this way of creating a funding platform for COVID nineteen initiative. Okay. Hmm. And yeah, I'll I'll send you um, uh, a link to a couple of videos for your context. Hmm. 
But yeah, if you want to join Slack, please do. Okay. Okay. And yeah, please look. send me a couple of your uh, papers that are the most relevant for me to understand your background and understand okay. how, how we can work together. Because I, I hear amazing things and they definitely resonate. The language is, is similar and yeah. No, no, definitely. Um, I can I can join Slack. And then actually you you reachable through Slack or through Slack is the best. It's the best. Okay. So I'll 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 join Slack and then actually uh, connect and uh, and share with you um maybe one one hackathon project uh, which is more concrete and then maybe some links to um to a few articles and things sure. I've done. Uh which is one one dimension of, of what could be done, but I think it's maybe one which you might be interested in at this stage. Sounds like a plan. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much for your time. All yeah. the best. Enjoy. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Huh?